Mrs. Mullins. Mrs. Mullins, do you have a guest with you? Okay. We're glad she's here. So we have a lady named Gail here. And she's visiting us this afternoon. We're glad for that. Okay, we're in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Uh, I'll just do 26 or 28, 28 to 30 again. And let's go ahead and pray first. Lord Jesus, I do pray you'd help us to understand your words, and I do pray you'd help us to know how we're to rightly divide these words and how we can apply them. We ask that you'd help us to be faithful students of uh, this book in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew eleven twenty-eight to 30. Just, I think last week I just kind of hit this in passing, and it's... Uh, has too much just to hit in passing. These three verses are uh, said by the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the only, and mark that down, the only uh, religious leader, if you call him a religious leader, in the entire history of this planet that can say something like this and fulfill it. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest. Rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All the religious labors and sacraments of men are null and void for salvation. And only true love, joy, and peace are found in Jesus Christ. Nobody can say something like this. Muhammad can't say this. Buddha can't say this. Confucius can't say it. Joe Smith can't say it. Uh, no pope can say it. No human can say it, really. Nobody can say it except the Lord Jesus Christ and fulfill it that he can give you peace and joy in your heart. And that's quite a statement for somebody to say. Verse 28, 29, and 30. When somebody would say a statement like this, or statements, uh, they uh, sure better have uh, the proof in the pudding. And, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. And I, and I, and I'm sure several of us, can bear witness to this fact. Inner peace, inner joy. Uh, peace and joy what is what everybody in the world is looking for. The young kid, the kids called peace or joy fun or happiness. And they're they mainly are looking for the joy, the fun, the happiness through parties, through whatever their little thing that they want to do. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's booze, maybe it's music. I don't know. They're trying to find fun or happiness. And after a generation or about uh, 10 or 15 years of pulling at, uh, they're tired of the joy, the happiness. Now they would like some peace. And the thing about joy and peace, it is never found looking for it. Joy and peace are nothing but byproducts of doing right. You don't find happiness or peace looking for them. Why do men get drunk? They're trying to have peace in their heart to get away from their sorrows. Love, joy, and peace is only found in Jesus Christ. Someone did a survey on a state university, asked the kids what they were looking for in life, and the number one answer was love. The number two answer was happiness, and the number three answer was peace, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. And that is a byproduct of Jesus Christ. When you start obeying this Bible, this old King James Bible, and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, and somebody may off the cuff say, well, how, how do you feel about life? you happy? And you say, yeah, you know what I am. But you never had to look for it. Because it's just something the Lord Jesus gives. Inner joy, inner peace. Nothing better than that. Uh, what's really good about it, it's free. That's good stuff. Okay, so I just want to kind of cover those three verses. Um, uh, the world religions are getting people enslaved to works and works and works and works. And they don't know they're going to heaven when they die. And God gave us a Bible. B-I-B-L-E means be informed before leaving earth. Uh, and that's why he gave us a Bible, so you can know where you're going when you die. Most don't. 
Okay, Matthew 12. We've been going through Matthew verse by verse, and we'll keep going right down through it. This is the best way to learn the Bible. Uh, just slow down and read everything as we go through it. And uh, ask the Spirit of God, the great teacher of the Bible, the author, to explain it. Give us some things as we go through here. This is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 12, 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day uh, through the corn, not in the cornfield. And his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn to eat. Now, if you just read that part, you may say, well, these guys are stealing this corn. Well, that's some Jewish laws, and we're dealing with a religion of Judaism. And it's under the Jewish laws that this was permissible. Okay, and uh, it's like sweet corn, going out there and picking some sweet corn and peeling it back and eating it. You say, without cooking it? Yeah, you ever have it raw? It's very sweet. Okay, it's very sweet. Okay, uh, dogs, you like to eat it. I won't eat whole corn. I'll, I'll chew off what I want and then throw them the rest, and then they get the rest. Okay, and so this is on a Sabbath day. A Sabbath day for the Jew was a Friday night, 6 o'clock, to Saturday night, 6 o'clock, and they were not supposed to do anything. And here we got some guys uh, supposedly going against some Jewish uh, laws. Supposedly. Verse 2, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do on a Sabbath day. Notice the word that they use. It's not lawful. It's not lawful. It's not lawful. You can be any government agent anytime you want and get a bunch of people in line and say, It's the law. And most people will believe you when you just made it up. Like what? It's the law to put a little X in the bottom right corner of this piece of document. It is? Yes, it's a law. And if you don't search it out, most people put a little right, a little X down there without even knowing it. <laughs> and uh, when somebody says it's a law, uh, the best thing to do is find out for yourself. You ever ask some government employees uh, about um, a procedure and you ask another one about the same procedure and ask another one about the same procedure, you get three different answers? They don't know what they're doing. Okay, so Matthew 12, verse 2, they said it's unlawful. Well, I'm not so sure about that. In fact, it was lawful what they were doing. But somebody said, oh no, it's unlawful what you're doing. Okay, now here's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Verse 4, 3. And he said unto them, have you not read what David did? That's kind of an insult. These guys are the ones who are supposed to be thorough readers of the law. And the Lord said, You mean to tell me you didn't read this? Slamming their intelligence. Uh, it's a different side of the Lord Jesus Christ than most people want to talk about. He's a man's man. And he'll deal with people the way a man would deal with them, especially the Pharisees. And he said to these religious smart Alex, he said, didn't you read this? Oh, I forgot. You only have a fourth grade reading level. This goes up to six. <laughs> uh, well, the Lord would do that. And as we read further, you'll see that the Lord will actually make an issue to get an argument going with these guys. Because that's what they're looking for. And they get quite upset with him. So, verse 3, have you not read what David did? Well, what did David do? Okay, so we've got to go in the Old Testament to find out what David did. The story that is being referred to here is found in 1 Samuel 21. 1 Samuel 21, the first six verses. And this is when David is on the run from Saul. He's trying to, uh, Saul is trying to kill him. And uh, David uh, takes the showbread, the bread that the priests were supposed to eat, and he takes it and he eats it. So, verse 3, have you not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest. 
Okay, what's the showbread? Okay, that showbread is uh, found in Exodus. Exodus uh, chapter 25. And that's when they have 12 loaves of bread in the temple. They had these 12 rows of bread. They were laid out in six here and six here. And it was just for show. Show bread. See how easy it is? That's how the English language is. It's, you know... I could I could try to try to quote some Greek, you know, but I don't know any to try to impress you with ed- education, but I can't. Show bread means it's just bread for show. Nothing hard about that. I don't have to prop up a system or anything. I'm not trying to get people to get tuition paid at a school. I'm very relaxed. <laughs> you say, what's the secret of these things? I get a dictionary. We got an eighteen twenty eight dictionary and get it for about fifty bucks. Save you thousands of dollars tuition, so since I'm helping you out on that, launch it for, you know. <laughs> That's what I tease Jeremy Wilson about down in Louisiana. Okay, uh, so it's just bread for show. Now, obviously, they have the 12 loaves. We can, we can imagine 12 loaves, pictures of 12 tribes. Laying them out in six and six, we can imagine six and six or 66 books in our Bible. And the showbread is uh, put on a table. And it was really only meant for the, you know, they keep it out there for so long, I guess, till it got stale or something, or, and then uh, the priest would eat it. I don't know how long they do it, but then they keep rotating it. Okay, so, but David took this bread and he took it and he went with him and his troops and they went off and they ate that. And it was supposed to be forbidden for him to do that, but he did it. So, the Lord is pointing that illustration out to these Pharisees. Verse 2, these Pharisees, uh, they would forgot about that. And then what the Lord does in verse 5 is He gives them another illustration in the Old Testament. He said this, Or, have you not read in the law? Again, smacking them in the face. How that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Okay, that one that he's making reference to is found in Numbers chapter 29, verse 32. Okay, so here's what the Lord does, okay? And this is what we can learn, is that when you're talking to somebody about an issue and they want to make an issue about something, well, the way you seesaw arguments is you find out what the final authority is or who the rules or what the rule book is. And when you figure out what the rule book is or what rules you're supposed to go by, then you yield to the rule book and you let it make the decisions. That's what makes sports so fun. There's a rule book involved. Now, hockey's a very, very small rule book. Not much goes on in that. And that's why so much fighting goes on in hockey. But even in hockey, there are rules that they follow. Okay, and that's what makes uh, sports fun with people is that two different people, two different teams are going by the same rule book and the best man wins. Okay, the same goes in life. And so in life, the reason why people argue about things and, and it, when you have an argument and nothing gets accomplished is because nobody has established the rules. That's the biggest thing, final authority. Get the rules established. If you're talking to a Jehovah Witness or to a Mormon or to a Catholic or to anybody of a different belief system, get the rules established. What is their final authority? Okay, and when they uh, come up with their final authority, that's the rules we go by. You say, well, what if they have more than one final authority? Then you're going to have a mess. Okay, so you've got to get them committed on the rules. And so, of course, the Lord already knows the rules with these guys. Uh, They are supposed to go by the 39 books in the Old Testament, and that is what he's quoting from. Verse 6, the Lord said, And I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Obviously making reference to himself. The Lord Jesus Christ, greater than the temple. Verse 7, But if he had known what this meaneth, oh, He's digging again, isn't he? Can you imagine all these intellectuals? And he says, if you knew what I meant. 
Meaning, you're not smart enough to know what I mean. If ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. The guiltless would be the disciples for eating sweet corn on the Sabbath day. Verse 8, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. Okay, there's their synagogue. That's the Jewish religious place for the building that they'd go to. A place where they'd study the Bible. Verse 10, it says, And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. So, sort of some uh, physical ailment, handicap, whatnot. And they asked him, saying, They ask him, they, who's they? Probably the Pharisees. Uh, ask him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? So what the Pharisees are doing is they're trying to set the Lord up, trying to get him in a position so that they can accuse him of something. So here they ask the question. There's other times where the Lord will ask this question, but they happen to ask it this time first. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? Verse 11, And he said unto them, uh, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Now, there's a great technique. A question is asked in verse 10. How does he answer the question? With a question. Very smart way to do things. That's being wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. That's when they throw the ball in your court. You say, oh, interesting ball. They throw it right back. And what it does, it puts all the weight back on them. They started it so we can finish it. Okay, now the question he's asking to these fellas, okay, he said, okay, fellas, you're upset about, I'm getting ready to heal somebody on the Sabbath day. Now, which one of you clowns wouldn't dig your sheep out of a hole if he, got, if he fell in on a Sabbath day? Well, of course, they all know they'd do it. It costs too, money, too much money to leave that thing down there. So he asked another question to back it up. How much more then is a man better than sheep? Well, an environmentalist or an animal rights activist wouldn't think that man's much better than sheep. I mean, if you kill an eagle, you get more time in jail if you murdered a human or some endangered species. That's how wacko these animal rights nuts are. They make it... I mean, uh, who's this guy out, uh, out west uh, that uh, is uh, charged with killing his wife as unborn baby? Unborn baby murdered? Yeah. Unborn baby murdered? Is, did I hear them say that correctly? Isn't that what an abortionist does? Boy, aren't we going to get to... Yeah. People often tell on themselves. And we just listen to them talk. The more, you know, it's, it's amazing. The more you let people talk, especially if you're dealing... Okay, if you're dealing with somebody of a different religious persuasion, just let them talk. Just let them talk and you'll find out they don't know a whole lot about what they believe. And you'll find the more they talk the more they contradict themselves. And you start asking them questions. That's fun to do with telemarketers. They just talk and talk and talk. And don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just... I had one guy, he went three minutes. I don't even know if he took a breath. Three minutes. And then he said, how does it sound to you? And I didn't say a thing. And he goes, hello. And I didn't say anything. He goes to the supervisor, somebody listen. He said, I've been talking for three minutes, but nobody's answering. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> he goes, Hello. And I'm just sitting there. <laughs> Finally, he says, Okay, hung up. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's funny to watch people. One, uh, one time, the owner of the radio station was mad at me because I'd said something on the radio. He, he's a Catholic. And I've never, he accused me of saying something against the Pope. I've never said to Pope on the radio. 
I said the guy with half a grapefruit on top of his head, but I've never said the Pope. And so uh, he got telling me, talking, and I just sat there and looked at him. And I'm not taking away your freedom of speech, and I'm not, and I, I'm, I, I, and I just sat there and looked at him. And he just kind of, his batteries wore out. And then I said, okay, thank you. Is that all you need? No problem. Left. Didn't change a thing. <laughs> it's fun to do that. It just watch them wear down. Because people can't stand silence. And that's kind of fun. <laughs> okay, so the Lord is pulling something like this. He's asked some questions. Verse 12, he said, How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Then saith he to the man... Stretched forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. He didn't shy away from the issue. Okay, so what is these guys' great reaction after this? They should be excited for their fellow. Doesn't it say, rejoice with them that rejoice? Don't you think this guy is pretty happy now? Oh, their great response, verse 14, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against them how they might destroy him. You talk about the arrogance and pride of man. I'd say probably one of the most arrogant, proudful uh, people in the Bible would have to be Pharaoh. For a guy to get smacked ten times and still lead his chariot down into the waters. You talk about slow learner. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I mean, this was Pharaoh ten times. Okay, so notice the word counsel. You'll find this all through the book of Acts, just the way it's spelled, C-O-U-N-C-I-L. And we went through this, we went through Acts. And that, generally speaking, is a group of people who are against the truth. So anybody, any religious group that calls themselves a counsel like this term, exactly like that, you automatically know about them that they don't know much Bible. Nicene Council, Vatican II Council, the Council of Trent, the UN Security Council, the Town Council, Student Council, and you go on and on. And so one of the worst things you can do is call yourself a council. In Acts chapter 15, when they had a big meeting to try to figure out what's going on in the book of Acts, one thing those men did not call themselves, they didn't call themselves council. Those disciples knew better. Okay, so this council, when you find this council come up in uh, the book of Acts, they will be against the apostles, and they will be fighting the truth all along the way. But the funny thing about these councils is that they were just, in essence, uh, they had no authority. And, you know, to me it's amazing. They have no authority, but yet they can bring people in to have a, and act like they got authority over them. Of course, that's what many courtroom settings are like. Okay, so here's what the Pharisees... Now, they wanted to kill Jesus, verse 14. Uh, the reason why they wanted to kill Jesus is because the Pharisees had made a very good living uh, drawing attention to ceremonial observances and religious rituals. They had, had nunneries, probably, where they were making candles and so that they could sell the candles to everybody in church and make a little bit of money that way. And so they made a lot of money on religious rituals. And they feared a loss of income or position uh, by the Lord's statement. Uh, the statement, for the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath. And uh, so that, they could see the handwriting on the wall. They could see that they were going to be out of a job. So they had to get rid of the Lord Jesus. They could not refute His miracles. They could not refute Him. They had to get rid of Him. So verse 14, 15. And when Jesus knew it, He withdrew Himself from thence, and great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them all. And charged them that they should not make Him known. Okay, why does He make this charge? Uh, it's because the Pharisees are soon to commit the, abominable, uh, the sin of abomination the unpardonable sin, that's what I was wanting, verse 31 32. 
And uh, because they had had opportunity to receive the Lord uh, once or twice at least, the Lord said, okay, that's enough. Don't tell them who I am. In one case, he did that with a man that he healed who was in Bethsaida. And this was after the curse of Bethsaida. And the guy was in the town and the Lord had already cursed the town. And he said, hey, uh, fella, uh, follow me. He led him outside of town, healed him. Then he said, now don't go back in town and tell them anything about me. Because of the curse. The Lord is very precise about these things. Okay, so that's why he's pulling something like this. You would tend to think that uh, the Lord would want everybody to talk about him. And generally speaking, that would be true. But in this case, he said no. But how do you shut up somebody who's healed? You can't shut them up. And they'll just, they cannot but help, they can't help but tell somebody. Especially if they've been blind all their life and now they can see, they've got to go around and put their fingers in everybody's faces and, yeah, that is the one that I was feeling. That's what it looked like. Oh, I wish I was blind again after looking at you. No. <laughs> you looked better when I couldn't see you. <laughs> Well, can't you imagine what these people went through? Oh, man, the excitement, the yelling, the screaming, the excitement, the tears being shed. And these Pharisees sitting on the side, we need to get rid of him. What if the Lord would have transferred ailments? Don't you know that would have been a different story? This one's blind, heal over here. Boom. That guy gets it. Pharisee will soon become a convert. It's like that guy with Jeroboam. Remember in 1 Kings 13, that young prophet goes in and preaches against the altar and Jeroboam standing there and he's mad about it. He said, get the guy. And the guy says something to him and then Jeroboam gets leprosy and then the guy, and then Jeroboam says, pray for me. Oh, how much is it worth to you? <laughs> Well, it'd be tempting, wouldn't it? Prayed for him on the spot, he got healed. Okay, well, these guys, verse 17. The Lord says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying. Okay, now you're going to see that the Lord, throughout his ministry, will give a, a prophecy or a hint that Gentiles are going to listen to him. Even though Jews aren't listening to me, the Gentiles will. And that's where we're going, verse 18. Behold my servant. Behold my servant. That will be Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Behold my servant. When the Jews read that, they read as they interpret the word servant as nation of Israel. Uh, but the servant is the Lord Jesus Christ, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Oh boy, here we go. Upset city. This was a magical word in Acts 22.22. When, when Paul was giving his testimony, speaking in Hebrew, the Jews was listening very intently, very closely. For 21 verses, they listened to him very closely. And as soon as he said the magical word, closing out the 21st verse, he said, Gentiles... Boom! It's about like saying anybody for pork at a bar mitzvah. And all of a sudden, right from then on out, they wanted to kill him. You know? Uh, in Acts chapter, uh, Luke chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking in uh, the synagogue. He's reading from Isaiah. He closes the book. He starts speaking. It says, The people marveled, marveled at the gracious words. At verse 23... By the time we get down to verse 30, they want to throw him over a cliff. Why? He didn't say the word Gentile. But he used two Gentiles as illustrations. And that was enough to make him mad. So those are people who are hypersensitive. People who are hypersensitive, a special magical word can set them off. Where's Americans at on this? Yeah, yeah. Somebody that uh, knows the truth, is, uh, knows the Lord, you can say anything you want. You ain't going to raise my blood pressure. 
I don't like I don't like being around a filthy mouth person. Uh, but some uh, cuss words are great words uh, to come back a witness to, and that usually shuts them up. Okay, so uh, and that's a kind of a roundabout way to get somebody to realize they need to keep their mouth shut. People say, oh, you got virgin ears? Yeah, I like to keep them as that way as much as I can. But of course, when you're going to jail, you're hearing all this stuff. Okay, so he's, he mentions Gentiles. Oh boy, we've got a problem there. Verse 19, Then the Lord said, He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench. Till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Well, that's a prophecy about you and me coming along. Thank God for that. So, he's got these things all through there, tucked away in the gospel stories. And every once in a while, you can kind of pick up on those things. And that's the Lord prophesying, here's what's going to happen. And, of course, we know that it's happened. Verse 22, we have paragraph mark. Then it says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil. Singular. Blind and dumb. And he healed him in so much that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, Here we go again. Uh, this fellow doth not uh, cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Okay, so now verse 22 down to 30 is the context there. And these guys are accusing the Lord Jesus of being Beelzebub. Uh, that means the Lord of the flies, another name for the devil, like Belial in the Old Testament. Then verse 31, 32, there's the, the great sin that Benny Hinn might quote to you if you happen to say, Benny, you're doing this by the devil. <laughs> he might quote this to you and just laugh at him. Okay, and this is how it's been committed. This is the official rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, as far as the leadership goes of the Jewish community. Okay, and they, they, they refer to Jesus as Beelzebub. The cross-reference on this is Mark 3, verse 22 to 30. Verse 25, and Jesus knew their thoughts. He knew their thoughts. And he knows mine too and he knows yours too. And he knew their thoughts and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How, then, how shall then his uh, kingdom stand? I heard a preacher mention that one time and says Satan kingdom stands because he's not divided. And I'm thinking, it's going to fall. It's totally divided. Satanism, if you read anything about Satanism, people getting saved out of it, you can get some books on it. There is no love in Satanism, none whatsoever. Anton LaVey and company, uh, they, it operates under one law, and that's the law of the jungle, the survival of the fittest. And whoever has the most devils in them will conquer somebody who has the least amount of devils, and then they will take the trump card with them. All the devils, too. And that's what all the push behind, uh, you know, the Pokemon cards, and then the D&D, &D, the Dungeons and Dragons, and then Harry Potter, and all this stuff. It's getting children who have a great faith to get geared up for these things. Satan kingdom is not going to stand because it is divided. Okay, so he's calling the Lord Jesus Christ Satan. And guess what? When the Antichrist shows up, they're going to call him Jesus Christ. The world will. The world always gets things backwards, it seems like. Verse 27, And if Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Oh, isn't that a dig? Ooh. Digging right in there. And that's how you do that. You set them up with your left and left, and all of a sudden the uppercut comes right in there. And it's all done by questions. Questions, questions, questions. Learn to ask the appropriate question. Powerful way to deal with authorities 
legal and spiritual. Questions. Then it says, therefore they shall be your judges. And this is exactly how the Lord will run the white throne judgment. It's going to be very interesting to watch. He says, out of thine own mouth will I judge thee. Luke 19. And that's going to be quite interesting. Verse 28, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house to spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he, shall, he will spoil, spoil his house? Okay, so uh, there's some good things on spiritual warfare. Now, the, the sanest, and I say sanest, uh, information that I've read on spiritual warfare... Uh, is um, Doc's book number 18, Theological Studies. That's probably the best. Uh, Jesse Penn Lewis has some things, but I think Doc's is better. Uh, his two videos, Dead Men, Mad Men, and Pigs, and then uh, one I think is called Demons or something like that, is pretty good stuff. Uh, there's a guy uh, that got saved out of... Uh, well, what did he get saved out of? This guy got saved out of anything you can name. Uh, Satanism, Mormonism, uh, Masonry, uh, Vampirism, uh, anything and everything. He got saved out of that stuff. And he's, he's a Ruckman's fan. And I think that's what helped straighten him out is he, he got appropriate training on spiritual warfare. Now, the Charismatics talk a lot about spiritual warfare, uh, but they're... Uh, uh, any, deliver, any church that puts up a little uh, sign, deliverance... Uh, you're dealing with somebody that needs delivered themselves. The only reason they can deliver other people is because they've got more devils in them. Uh, that's not the Lord's pattern. The Lord's pattern is not to be looking for these things. We just should know what to do when, when it crosses our path. And it's not something to play around with. Okay, and so we have, as, as a New Testament Christian, with the blood of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the name of Jesus Christ, and as uh, as Satanism and Wicca and everything is is on the on the rise, uh, you must know what you're doing, and you must know uh, what the scriptures teach. And like I said, that you know, I think uh, doctors did an excellent thing on that theological eighteen. Okay, then verse uh, 30 it says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me is scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you. Now here's the thing. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Period. Now he don't he don't he doesn't really define it there. You can get you can get some, but it's not defined as clearly here as it is in Mark. So if you look at Mark chapter three, and when I've you know for years and years people would ask what that part of sin is, and I said I don't know what it is. Baptists usually teach it's the final rejection of Jesus Christ. I don't know where they come up with that, but that's what they teach. When I read that, I said, boy, he must have really read between the lines to come up with that one. Of course, charismatics teach that it's whenever we would say that they're doing things by mental telepathy or, the, you know, of course, that's what they say. Well, in Mark 3, it's, it's pretty clear. You'll see in Mark 3, 28 and 29, which are parallel of what we just read in Matthew. Virtually similar. Verse 29 has a colon at the end. So there's our definition, verse 30. Because they said. The unpardonable sin is, doing, is, is saying something. What did they say? They said, He, Jesus Christ, hath an unclean spirit. What did they say? When they said, Jesus Christ hath Beelzebub, that is a blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, and the ones that said that were doomed to hell 
from that moment on, and there's nothing going to change that. As a nation, that became the official, the official rejection of the Messiah. The next chapter 13, everything goes into a mystery form, and it is nothing but a fight from the king of the hill all the way to Calvary. On Calvary, the Lord said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. God forgave them. Now we've got Acts. It gives them a second chance. So technically speaking, it cannot be committed today because the Lord Jesus Christ is not having an earthly ministry and nobody can say that about him. Okay, so that's the Matthew 12, 31, 32. We'll stop there. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness, for your blessings. Lord, I do pray that uh, if someone here is not uh, saved, that uh, you might uh, convict them, bring them to the Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be faithful students of this word, of this book. In Jesus' name, amen.